that God loves them and this community of faith loves them too. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. Let's have a moment to center our hearts and minds on God for our worship today. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, full of compassion and mercy, abounding in steadfast love. Amen. Trust in God's promise of forgiveness. Let us confess our sin against God and one another. Eternal God, our creator, in you we live and move and have our being. Look upon us, your children, the work of your hands. Forgive us all our offenses and cleanse us from proud thoughts and empty desires. By your grace, draw us near to you, our refuge and our strength. Through Jesus Christ, our sin. Amen. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit given to us. In the mercy of Almighty God, Christ died for us while we were still sinners. And for his sake, God forgives you all your sins. Amen. Will you rise as you are able? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, in peace, let us pray to the Lord.
let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, throughout time you free the oppressed, heal the sick, and make whole all that you have made. Look with compassion on the world wounded by sin, and by your power restore us to wholeness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. The Old Testament lesson is from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 5, verses 12 through 15, a reading from Deuteronomy. Observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy, as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God, and you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male or your female slave, 
or your ox or your donkey or any of your livestock or the resident alien in your town so that your male and female slave may rest as well as you. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day, the word of the Lord. <clears throat> the New Testament lesson is from the second letter of Paul to the Corinthians, chapters 4, verses 5 through 12, a reading from Corinthians. We do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slave for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in clay jars so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies. For while we live, we are always being given up to the death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be made visible in our mortal flesh, so death is at work in us, but life in you. The word of the Lord. All right, it's time for the children's message. So any kids are invited to come forward at this time. Hi, Tommy. How are you? Good. Good. Oh, it looks like it's just going to be you and I this morning. Is that Okay. Julia doesn't want to come. Oh, Mom will come with Julia. Yeah. Oh, well, in our first lesson for today, we heard about the word Sabbath. Have you ever heard the word Sabbath before? That's kind of a big church word, yeah. And so we hear it in, in the Old Testament lesson. We're going to hear it in our gospel lesson. And we, it, it comes from God. Uh, we hear in the creation story, which you guys get to talk about during VBS this week. But we hear that after God made creation, God took Sabbath. Now, sometimes we say rest, but rest isn't quite big enough. It means a, a better word would be to cease. And the word cease means to stop. Now, I know you all are farmers, so you work hard all the time. But what do you have a break from right now that you don't have to wake up early and go to every day? What'd you just finish? Yeah, you just finished kindergarten. So you're on a break from school, although are you going to Boys and Girls Club instead? Yeah, and Julie, are you going to daycare this summer? Yeah, yeah, but when you're done with Boys and Girls Club for the day, do you get to go home? And do you have to work all night when you get home, or do you get to have some fun too? Yeah, so having some fun, that is kind of like Sabbath for kids. So when we say the word rest, what do you think of? Is there something really awful that you have to do in the afternoon that sometimes is the word rest? Take a nap. Do you like taking a nap? No, my kids don't either. No, uh-uh. They think taking a nap is horrible. But do you want to know a secret? All these people out here, <laughs> they love taking naps. They think naps are awesome. So one day, a nap won't be so bad. But the word rest, it doesn't really mean taking a nap. It means stopping from the stuff that is horrible or hard or no good or the things that kind of keep us apart from one another. So being able to play and have fun for a kid, even though that's not taking a nap, that is having Sabbath for kids. So that's kind of cool, huh? That you get to take part in Sabbath, which God has commanded for us. Well, will you pray with me by repeating after me? Dear God, thank you for the gift of Sabbath 
so we may be restored to do your work. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. All right, thanks for coming up this morning. You can head back to your seats. And will you rise for the gospel acclamation? This morning's Holy Gospel comes to us from the Gospel of St. Mark, the second chapter, beginning with the 23rd verse. Glory to you, O Lord. One Sabbath, he, meaning Jesus, was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need of food? He entered the house of God, where Abiathar was high priest, and ate the bread of the presence, which it is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. But he gave some to his companions. Then Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made for humankind, and not humankind for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. Again, he entered the synagogue, and a man was there who had a withered hand. They watched him to see whether he would cure him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, Come forward. Then he said to them, Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. He looked around at them with anger. He was grieved at their hardness of heart and said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, out and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately conspired with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. I want to share one of my favorite stories with you all this morning. It's a story um, that can be used in many different contexts, but this one highlights a, a part of our gospel reading for today. So there once was a newlywed couple. Now, they were a thoughtful couple, and they wanted to create some meaningful rituals and traditions together, R rituals and traditions that would honor their families of origin, but were also special for them. So the wife said, you know, growing up, mom would make a nice ham dinner on Sunday. It was something that she grew up doing too. I mean, you know how grandma loves to bake and cook. So is that something that we could do? Well, of course, replied the husband. And so on Sunday, the wife gets all the ingredients and is ready to get everything prepared. And she takes this nice, beautiful ham and cuts about an inch and a half off the end of each ham. Honey, what are you doing? exclaimed the husband. That's wasting good ham. The wife said, what do you mean, what am I doing? I mean, that's how you prepare ham. At least that's the way my mom always prepared it. So later that night, the wife called her mom and told her about this strange encounter with her husband and asked, so mom, why do we cut the ends off the ham? And her mom said, well, that's just how you prepare ham. I mean, that's how I learned how to prepare it from watching your grandma. I guess I haven't thought about it too much. It's just what you do. So the next day, mom went and visited grandma and said, Grandma, why do you cut the ends off of ham? And grandma said, well, my pan's too small to fit the ham any other way. <laughs> So this story helps us to see what Jesus was saying when he says the Sabbath was made for humankind, not humankind for the Sabbath. So it's a story about flipping. So the wife and her mom, they assume that they did what they did because it was about the ham. But really, it started 
with grandma because it was about the pan. So, right, the ends of the ham had to be cut off to fit the pan. But throughout the years, the ritual and the tradition, I mean, that original meaning was lost. And so this tradition was started, and it seemed that it was about the ham when really it was about the pan. And so this passage and these words of Jesus, I mean, they're about how we practice Sabbath, not for Sabbath's sake, but for our sake and for the sake of all humankind. So we also cut the ends off the ham, if you will, if we try to minimize this passage by saying, well, Jesus had no regard for the laws or for the commands, so it really doesn't matter what we practice or how we practice. Now, Dr. Matt Skinner explains it like this. To the Pharisees, this behavior, behavior of the disciples and Jesus appears to deliberately neglect the mandate to observe Sabbath and keep it holy, which we heard both in Exodus and in our first lesson for today. And Jesus disagrees, not because he regards the, the Sabbath commandments as trivial, but because he sees the larger picture, one that regards the Sabbath in a different light. So Jesus turns to another piece of scripture, the story of David, to interpret scripture, the purpose of Sabbath. He says that Jesus contends that sometimes certain demands of the law are rightly set aside in favor of pursuing greater values or meeting greater needs. He says it's these needs, especially when it promotes well-being and, the, and to facilitate the arrival of a divine blessing. So how does Sabbath promote well-being and blessing? Now, we've talked about Sabbath before, but it's been a while, so I want to recap. Um, and we heard a little bit about it during the children's sermon today. So the word Sabbath, it's the Hebrew word Sabbath or Shabbat, um, and it means to cease. Now, in our first story of creation in Genesis, we hear the word Sabbath a few times, but it's always as the word rest. So it says, on the seventh day, God finished the work that God had done, and God rested, or Sabbathed, on the seventh day from all the work that God had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, set it apart as holy, because on it God rested, God Sabbathed, from all the work that God had done in creation. Now, as I shared during the children's sermon, something is lost if we think about the word only as rested. I mean, it does on one hand mean rested, but it also means something deeper, to cease. So Sabbath is important because to cease is part of God's creation. And this became really important after the Israelites' time of, uh, in, Ex or in Egypt and the Exodus because the Israelites, they were slaves for the Egyptians. And so after they were freed, Sabbath was given to them as a gift in the Ten Commandments. So in Egypt, there was no ceasing. We're told that Pharaoh saw the Israelites' growing population, and he uh, looked at them with fear and distrust and decided to enslave them. And so this fear that Pharaoh had, this enslavement that he did to the Israelites, he made them work unceasingly, never stopping, making bricks, building cities, so that Pharaoh could accumulate wealth. And then the Israelites saw freedom. And with that freedom they heard from God, that Sabbath, ceasing, is a natural part of life. So to be commanded to Sabbath is a way of saying, you are made in God's image, and God ceased on the seventh day of creation, and so you cease, you Sabbath too. And the you that we hear in scripture isn't just a singular, us personally ceasing, but it means everyone has those moments of ceasing, everyone we're in relationship with, whether it's our families, our friends, our coworkers, our hired help, everyone is required to Sabbath. So Sabbath is a command, but it's also a gift. And in our gospel text for today, Jesus does two things on the Sabbath. He and his disciples plucked and then ate grain, and then Jesus went and healed a man. 
Now, these two things might seem like minor offenses, even appropriate actions for the Sabbath, as we hear Jesus say. I mean, shouldn't people eat? Shouldn't people be healed? But these religious leaders, the Pharisees, who were chastising them for working on the Sabbath, they felt that Jesus and his disciples should have gathered food the day before instead of working on the Sabbath. So they felt that they were intentionally neglecting the command. And so they got narrowly focused on the fact that ceasing means no work. And it seems that they cut the ends off the ham by saying it's better to go hungry than it is to pluck some grain. Now that's one opinion. And other scholars will say that the Pharisees knew that, that it would be better for someone to eat some grain rather than to go hungry. But the reason that the Pharisees seemed so narrowly focused at at this instance was because it was Jesus who was doing this. So Jesus is gaining popularity. And this text is kind of a pivot point for us in the Gospel of Mark. It's cementing the fact that there's this chasm between the Pharisees and Jesus and that the divide is just going to get wider and wider. Now, in the next few weeks, our gospel lessons will help us to see how that's getting wider. So we won't talk about that much today, but we'll talk more about Sabbath, about ceasing and being given life. So Sabbath, it's resting from the hustle and bustle, uh, being rejuvenated to take part in God's good creation once again. So you could say it another way, Sabbath is about life, being given life. So keeping the Sabbath then can get lived out in many ways, but keeping the Sabbath is always going to be life-giving. And that's what we talked about with Tommy and Julia this morning, that for kids, that ability to play is Sabbath, and sometimes for adults, taking a nap is Sabbath. But it's more than that. It's more than just play or just sleep. It's about our actions and the values that we have. So if we participate in Sabbath, we see that we value life. And we see through Jesus what life looks like. It looks like worshiping God. It looks like rejuvenation. And it looks like being in relationship with one another or being in community. So those are our values. Now in Exodus, we also see Sabbath as an act of resistance, which is a very interesting thing to think about. So the life in Egypt was saying, these are to be your values, to work endlessly, to produce endlessly. That is what's most important. And Sabbath says, no, it's not that. It's about life. It's about community. It's about rejuvenation. So talking a little bit more about rest versus ceasing. So rest is important. And I think rest is especially important for us as it seems that our calendars each week and year just get more and more full. And it seems that the more full our calendars are, the harder it is to connect and cultivate relationships. So on one hand, Sabbath is taking a rest from a full calendar, but it's more than that. So it's important to have real, meaningful relationships. We need to work at uh, loving our neighbor, being in relationship, and that does take work. That does take time on a calendar. So what does it mean also to cease? So to cease could mean to quit moving your bodies or to rest, but ceasing could also mean uh, ceasing unhealthy habits or ceasing fear or distrust. So we can cease from our usual work and we can instead move towards action and towards relationship. So I was thinking about that. What does it look like to cease? What does it look like to have Sabbath? What could we have Sabbath from? So we could have Sabbath from anxiety or fear, or all the things that cause us to distrust God and our neighbor. So we could have a Sabbath from um, turning inward on ourselves, being so focused on just our own calendar and not looking more broadly. And I'm kind of focused on the calendar. Maybe it's also a sign of our own life. 
But if our calendar says we're too busy, perhaps we need Sabbath from that mentality and instead have Sabbath that allows us to connect and cultivate deep and meaningful relationships with one another. Because Sabbath is a gift from God. It's something that helps us to reorient our lives into a right relationship. So right relationship with God, right relationship with one another. So Sabbath calls us to make choices, to name our priorities, to live out our values. So how will you live Sabbath this next, this next week? How will you shift your relationship with God and with your neighbor? Thanks be to God. Amen. Will you please rise as you are able as we confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again, he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we pray today, each petition will end, Hear us, O God, and will you please respond, Your mercy is great. So filled with the Holy Spirit, we join the church in every place, praying for the world that God so loves. God, our strength, you command your people to keep Sabbath. Coax your church away from the busyness of the world and give us holy rest and ceasing, so that refreshed we might give vibrant witness to your world-healing love. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. God, our strength, we ache for peace. Teach nations that you carry our burdens, you free human hands, and you rescue us in distress. Raise up leaders in the world who listen to your voice and walk in your ways. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. God, our strength, people are afflicted and perplexed, persecuted and struck down. Shine the light of your glory into the hearts of your suffering ones so that they will not be crushed, driven, driven to despair, or forsaken. Hear us, O God. God, our strength, death is at work in us, but life is in you. 
Free us now to live your promise of indestructible life, and in the end, restore us with all the saints. We especially remember Kurt Morkin and his family today. Hear us, O God. By the sure guidance of your Holy Spirit, O God, we lift up our prayers in trust and thanksgiving. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As members of God's household, I pray the peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us share a sign of God's peace with one another at this time. As you are ready, I invite you to be seated and we will continue with our offering. This morning we wanted to highlight our generosity corner and particularly our building and maintenance fund. So how many of you are homeowners, car owners, so how many of you have had some sort of big maintenance type issue with your home or your car that you knew was going to be coming, and so you saved to take care of it, and then four or five more issues appeared right about the same time? Does that happen to anyone else? Oh, good. <laughs> well, in some ways, maintaining a large church facility is similar to home or car ownership. And so we are grateful for the generous giving to the Building and Maintenance Fund to help us be able to care for this place, keeping it a place where we're able to thank God, share Jesus, and help others. So because of your generosity to the Building and Maintenance Fund, we this month have been able to take care of five issues that have come up. Um, the first, we've switched our lights to LED um, during a time when we were offered a significant rebate, and it's also going to be uh, better for the environment and also lower our electric bill. The second thing we approved this month was painting all of the lower level Sunday school rooms, which hasn't been done in more than a decade. A third project, which you all saw this morning, is that your car was parked on a newly resurfaced parking lot. Um, the fourth is that we've had to, or we're going about to replace our fire alarm system because the old one is not functioning properly. And the fifth project is that we have had several gutters that are hanging on by threads and they need to be replaced. So these projects total just over $28,000. And because of your gifts to that fund, we're able to take on all of the projects right now. So giving to the Building and Maintenance Fund helps us to live out our values of relationships, hospitalities, and outreach, keeping our buildings safe and functional for things like worship, vacation Bible school, boys and girls club, even housing the backpack feeding program, and so much more. So thank you for being generous. Will you please rise for our offertory? Let us pray. Merciful God, everything in heaven and earth belongs to you. We joyfully release what you have entrusted to us. May these gifts be signs of our whole lives returned to you, dedicated to the healing and unity of all creation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Is there a next slide for the... Oh, okay. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. 
He blessed it broken and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again after supper, he took the cup. After he had given thanks, he gave it to all of them, saying, Take and drink. This cup is the new covenant of my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. The congregation may be seated. And please know that all are welcome today to join in this meal of God's love and forgiveness and grace. Um, we'll gather either standing or kneeling around the rail, beginning at the center and moving out. We have gluten-free wafers if that is a need for you. Um, and we commune with individual cups today. Um, and there is grape juice located in the center of each tray. And you can place your cups in the baskets at the end of each rail uh, before continuing to your seats. Come, for all things are now ready.
Will you please rise as you are able? May these gifts of Jesus' body and blood strengthen you and keep you always in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. God of abundance, with this bread of life and cup of salvation, you have united us with Christ, making us one with all your people. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now receive God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace, serve the Lord.